Welcome. This is the October 10th Beehive Production User Call. We have Andrew, Tara, Patrick, Jan, John, and myself so far. Uh, pro tip, whatever you do, do not search Hitler uses Docker. Uh, for those who have been following the multi-year hypercall review for Beehive, I welcome you to look at this ancient re uh, review, which is D8100. And uh, we would all like to talk about various bugs relating to VNet under KVM guess. And I just said, Antronig juice, Antronig juice, Antronig juice, and Antronig has just shown up. Antronig, can you hear us? Oh, well, the, the, the myth is if you if you say my name three times, I manifest in front of you and tell you to install FreeBSD on bare metal. Precisely. That's <laughs> why we're here. So we're going to talk about FreeBSD on KVM, but we're as close yes. as we can get. Yeah. So Patrick, catch... thank you very much for the email, by the way. I'll, I will be working on that on mon Monday, Monday, Tuesday. And, Tuesday. Uh, yes. So and we and and apparently the same bug also exists in DigitalOcean. So this was Vulture specific, as I recall. Or we thought Vulture actually it or was. Go ahead and describe it for our listeners. Sure. So I thought it was Vulture specific, and then a, a customer of mine was on DigitalOcean. Of course, DigitalOcean doesn't have FreeBSD out of the box anymore, which is very sad. Uh, but then I'm like, you know what, let me just try like making a custom image and trying it. And I tried and I got the same issue. Now, luckily, both Volter and um, uh, DigitalOcean do both of them run on KVM, Chemu KVM. But for the love of God, I'm not able to replicate it on my own Chemu KVM on my Mac OS or on my Linux box or on my anything. Just on the cloud providers, I'm able to replicate it. Like, what are they doing differently? Oh, is there that's a, a patch that point. they ship? <laughs> um, okay. I, assume, I, I, uh... I did encounter it first on DigitalOcean, actually. And I've, you didn't? I've been, I've been running my FreeBSD VMs first at DigitalOcean. Then when they did FreeBSD support, I said, okay, uh, fine, guys. I can uh, go to another provider. And then I went to Vulture. And I have been running with a rather convoluted IF config line uh, disabling uh, receive and transmit checksums uh, in hardware that works. And then somebody posted on, on the FreeBSD forum or on, on some of the bug reports that said, put put this in loader.conf and you're fine. And I mean, OK, it disables checksums, but heck, upper layers have their own checksums, so I'm probably fine. Um, yes and no. You're fine, but it wastes a bunch of memory bandwidth and thereby CPU cycles if you have fast networking. Yeah. Because unlike the modifying header checksums normally during nothing or something, to really compute the checksum in software, the network stack has to add up basically all the bytes mm -hmm. in a... Um, yeah. yeah. So it's... It's a cheap checksum, but the expensive part is just touching every packet of uh, payload bytes uh, in the kernel again to compute the damn checksum, which is so primitive that it's easy for the NIC to compute. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, for crypto, anything encrypted has a should have some form of authentication, uh, which is a vastly stronger checksum. Uh, you have to compute in software, but for bulk transfers, it's really annoying to have basically one more copy uh, in the network stack. Mm -hmm. You can't avoid it if your hoster has a broken stack, so you have to pay that cost. Uh, and for one gig networking, you can easily just root first through it with a reasonably powerful CPU core, but... Uh, yeah. So, so we we got, and I don't know if I told you about this, Michael. We got accepted into the Volter marketplace, so oh, we can now sh nice. ship applications. Thank you. We FreeBSD, uh, we Jailer, we oh, dot com. We we my company Luria. So, and the goal is to publish Jailer itself, so people can just choose a Jailer image, which would be FreeBSD, but already pre-configured to be using with Jailer. And we're also doing like GUI. Uh, uh, integration with the Vulture web interface. So from the Vulture web interface, you would see how many jails that you're running, which I think is neat. 
Um, so that, that's kind of nice. But we, we had this problem for a long time and we also have other problems, but everything is fixable with like playing with tunables. But I prefer to modify as less as possible from the upstream. Right, that would be the ideal goal. Mm -hmm. So on Tuesday we'll be having a call with the uh, what do you call that account manager or whatever in the enterprise world, and uh, they'll be having a list of our bugs. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, I, I hope it goes to a proper because if we can identify why this is happening, the why sounds more interesting. So it might be on the FreeBSD side, it might be on actually on their side. Uh, running Omni OS on Vulture is a whole other problem. It reports itself as a Windows host. Like, do you remember the GitHub? Like, it's like, I am Hyper-V. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> so they did some weird hacks there to be able to run Windows VMs. So let, let, let's see how that goes. And uh, I'll, I'll talk with them and, and, and see what, what we can achieve overall. Uh, Omni OS on DigitalOcean, on the other hand, is working fine. For example, I just upload the cloud image that they call, you know, the... the and uh, it just just boots and everything. Of course, they don't give IPv6 on cloud images for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's too hard. But uh, uh, but what, yeah, that's what that's just this. happened. Yeah, cool. Google Docs has been going crazy the last couple of yeah. What the what? Okay, love it. Um, days. Yeah, I just flew off to who knows where. Okay, so sorry <laughs> about that. Um. Tara, it sounds like you might have some insight on either of those platforms or similar ones and have an idea of what slightly might be tickling the network stat that we only see it in, ver in cloud environments, but not local, maybe, maybe? It could, could be. I mean, there is the significant difference between using KVM and Libvirt on, on a single host with as it is ah. uh, compared to, to OpenStack because OpenStack uses um, Cinder and Neutron for, for storage and network. And that underlying is actually VIX. If they use OVN, it's an actually OVN switch using VIX lands. So it really depends. I, I can tell you that I'm pretty sure that DigitalOcean runs OpenStack and runs Ceph. Uh, so, you had a neat name in there for the either storage or it was a uh, oh, Cinder. So Cinder, the, those you. are the mod, those okay. are the modules of uh, I will write on it or actually yeah Cinder. Yeah, uh, Nip can, uh, yeah I'll 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 patch the document. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, op op OpenStack has like thirteen different components. There's like mm. Nebula for networking, and there's another one for just image management and. And there's this, yeah, Cinder, a neutron, yeah, need neutron from it's 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 a yeah. it's a it's a yeah. big... it and, 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 and they're using all of the programming languages. So there are parts in Python, parts yeah. in Java, parts in Perl. Uh, to try to hire try to hire a systems engineer with that profile. Okay. Uh, John, and, you had thank something? you. Thank Good you very question. much. That's my nightmare. I've been working on OpenStack for more than ten years. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, oh. you have you have my deepest respect. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Good, good, good friend of mine called this uh, technology Jenga in uh, in a presentation. I, I can't actually. Can you, this you... is the reason I'm. I was hired in this job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick thing, John. What do you have? Oh, uh, I was. Uh, first of all, I agree. I should bow to Tara. If she'd been doing it for ten plus years, um, um, send me your resume. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, that, yeah, with, with OpenStack, it also depends on which version of OpenStack you're running. There are so many configuration paths through that code. It's it's just not funny. I've been starting to look at putting Dalmatian up, and it's uh, it's got all it's got changes in it too. What is Dalmatian? Well, their latest version. Okay. Who's who? Okay, who's the marketing person who's just coming up with? wacky names for these things come on uh, it's it's probably that dog breed with an a it's okay. it's actually a vote it's a vote really yeah they come with shorted with a short of usually three or four names they actually vote for the release name and the release name it's alphabetic so okay. we restarted because when i started it was diablo with d it's like it, yep. it might make ubuntu release a scheme Okay. So it doesn't mm. involve a uh, a dictionary and a dartboard. 
Not a blender. Yeah, yeah probably a blender. Probably misspelled, eh? Yeah. Will uh, it blend? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen those in a while. So from Diablo, we're up to what letter? Like H for horrible or J? Yeah. Janky? Or... I don't know. Sorry to beat up on M that. M for mess. M for mess. <laughs> cool. Okay. That said, um, any other cloud KVM FreeBSD interaction stories, questions, or t-shirt ideas, or shall we move on? Uh, I maybe I taught this in the GL calls. I just want to put it on the record in yes, the Beehive call as well. That uh, after doing the PCI pass through of the NIC and making sure that our NFS stuff is in a separate back backplane uh, and making sure that all of the Chelsea features are enabled. They have a very awesome, like 50 page document for Chelsea on FreeBSD, What's which is like from you a just decade. Said it. Oh, oh yes. yeah. Okay. Which Got is, which, which is, which is, which is, yeah, which is from a decade ago, but it's still like very up to date. Like it, not, not that a lot of things have, have been changed. We haven't had even a single issue with NFS after doing that change. So a separate backlane for storage, uh, enabling all the Chelsea free BSD features, making sure that the kernel drivers are all up to date. I'm able to get 10 gigabit a second for NFS easily compared to before, which was like every couple of days, I keep seeing server not responding, server not responding. And we have home on NFS, we have projects on NFS. So like everything was on NFS. With a new model, it's working, it's working perfectly fine. Um, and it's it's been going very well. And uh, did you say you were the? Did mm -hmm. you say you were passing the Chelsea card through via PCI pass through? Yes. Yeah. yeah, works great. Yeah, it it works good. So we have a free BSD host and a Linux guest, and uh, one of the Chelsea on NICs is on the free BSD. The other Chelsea on NIC is passed to 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 the guest. They are attached to a Microtik cloud uh, switch as they call it, you know, the fanciest switches. And uh, it, it works perfectly fine. Uh, I, it, uh, to put it on, on, on perspective, we, I haven't seen a, a message from my users for like 20 days. Like historically it was every, you know, two days, something is down. Now it's like no 20 days, is everything news. is working. No news is good news. Yeah, boring is perfect. Yeah. So. Okay, Andre. Uh, just before you join, John pointed out that he is uh, also doing some large one-to-one -one VM, where it's a um, very large VM on a host. I don't know what you can reveal about that, but hey, similar situation. I'm glad that Chelsea is treating you well. Sorry, Michael. I said please do not share publicly. Oh, I did. <laughs> In a separate. This was line. a presentation yeah. given by oh. a friend of mine at a closed event, and I have no general permission to send Got it. it. Out so to sorry. Oh, hopefully, no one saw that flyby. I'm share. I'm sharing it with you specifically. I see that. Sorry about that. Uh, you, 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 I, I'm multitasking here. So sorry. I can uh, blank out the video if necessary. So I'll. I, I will. I will pass on one piece of information. Please. Um. Many of the systems that I consume have a have a bias setting for maximum performance, maximum power, if that sounds familiar to most of you. I, we have been, ex for support purposes, we have been experimenting with getting some of our larger servers off of the physical hardware and running as VMs. And when you do that, that allows you to reboot the box in in seconds compared to anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes for some of these things. We use PCI pass through to pass through network cards. We pass through HBAs. We pass through NVMe, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing that I have found when running some of the Linux guests is to use idle equal poll. If you're familiar with that as a kernel option. And that allows the, the, the cores to spin on the guest, in the guest, and you get a much snappier response from the system. Your latency will go down. So instead of M-rate or? 
I'm sorry. So Instead of N rate, where does that setting go? It's no yeah. M rate. Oh, that would that goes it, like your it's a it's a kernel configuration option. So it's like kernel grub, command line. Grub uh, grub dot grub to grub dot conf grub two dot conf your wherever your Linux variation puts it. At that point, wouldn't it be easier for you and get you the same advantage to uh, configure Beehive not to yield the guest vCPUs? I have run both. I have found idle equal poll gives me the better situation. Okay. I don't. I do not disagree with your option setting. As a matter of fact, I have a comment somewhere that says they're almost the same in my doc. Exactly. It is, and it's probably easier for you to standardize something by doing it on the hypervisor than having to go into each guest and change and make sure that after a big upgrade, whoever. It's responsible for that VM doesn't do something stupid, like um, just clobber all your customizations. Uh, yeah, understood. I all, <laughs> all of the, all the configuration for the guest is automated. Yeah, I'm but a very... I assume one of the reasons you want to do this is so that you can have an uh, organizational boundary between the physical hosts and the virtual machines. Not just boot time. Yeah, there are there's various support reasons for why we're going after this. Should we care about the alternative syntax or not so much? Sure, you can. Uh, sure, what was, you it can. was idle equals poll, and Jan, you had one that you were comparing to. Uh, um, idle equals no M rate. Uh, idle equals no M rate. Thank you. Because basically, it should do something like an M rate to rate or halt. Depending on wait, wait. I think it's M wait. Ah, oh, that's yes. M wait for memory rate. It's an instruction to wait for that cache line to be uh, accessed. Uh, basically, wait until this memory location is gets touched by someone hmm. else. Is there an underscore or something, or it's as simple as no, that? no. Okay. Uh, uh, I know. There's an uh, the M like Michael between no and wait. Uh, yeah. Nom nom nom. Okay. Yep. Fine. 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 Uh, we'll be we'll be migrating a hospital uh, ESXi infrastructure to Beehive in the next week. Uh, if anyone has any notes, so the, we, this is not the first time that we're doing it. However, it's the first time that we're migrating Windows machines because uh -huh. our previous customers they like ESXi, but it's all yep. Linux, and migrating that to FreeBSD was as simple as you know, using chemdo image commands to convert the images and then uh, change some network configuration. Uh, Windows, I'm assuming, is going to be different. But if anyone has any notes that I can pass to my team, so we don't, and none of us are, none of us even like Windows, so it it would be very um, can you nice of you ask them to set up a fresh installation of whatever mechanism they use, golden image, whatever they use to deploy a new VM. So that you get a um, you, VM so, to so Jan, Jan, so Jan, you're, you, uh, this is what I learned, and I don't. I, I know it's going to sound offensive, and I like it when it sounds offensive. Windows people don't have a concept of a golden image. Like I asked them, do you have a golden image that you use? And their reaction was, what the hell is that? I'm like, it's a template. They're like, what is a template? I'm it's like, it's what you use to install. Right, and their it reaction was. was and their reaction was, you know, if we want to reinstall, we just mount the Windows ISO every time and install every time from scratch every time. So, okay, so you uh, have a process at least. What uh, I would yeah. say is, uh, is a strong to phrase set up for a that. Good... Yes. <laughs> it's very generous to call that a process, but still, badly, I would ask them to please set up a just dummy VM like we would normally set up one and then try to migrate that one first if you've never done it. Yeah. So that and you of don't course, end up with a system which brings all the baggage of um, personal data and so on, or um, having to make sure that you don't accidentally roll back to the something, just get a test system. And another so one that machine. we... 
Yes, and uh, this 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 is this is like a nightmare scenario for us because the ESXi is using hardware RAID. I I I, I didn't know that you if, is it even recommend. Like, I know ESXi has software RAID, right? Like they were one of the coolest kids who did software really? RAID like no, no, very they early. They, they Wait, don't have what? software RAID like at all? No, no redundancy unless you use hardware RAID. Yeah, oh my baby. god! Because um, you have to use an external storage array. Vendors, vendors, vendors. Well, that's um, true, but they, and I want to say one of the later four releases, they added a thing that would do, that would like take multiple machines with local storage and you do redundancy between them for the storage, I think. You can some, do something they are like busy. this. Decent. You can do something like this if you buy another product by some of the software defined storage vendors. Yeah. Who, no, who v no VMware actually TV. made their own so product. You create, for it. So you create your redundant distributed iSCSI storage in your VMware hosts while the same VMware hosts are hosting the virtual machines on that very same storage. It's what nightmares are built of once. VMware yeah. eventually yeah. made their own product for it. Yeah. Um, so, so I this a apocalypse. So I've been, I mean, I've, it, been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been following ESXi and vSphere up to eight, and there is no local redundancy of storage anywhere to be seen. I I, I don't understand how are they even popular in enterprise. Like well, they're I, rapidly I, getting with, not with, with with big external storage things from EMC squared and NetData. Huh. They came early. They had a Windows UI. They had uh, a way for companies to interface with them. And you have something approaching a single grain of glass for all of it, even if it's Windows only. And yeah, they came very early and they told companies, hey, do you want to turn uh, four racks into one? Um, going forward, hmm. and okay. the one where it contains a little more pricey hardware. But <laughs> if you think back to before on prem virtualization, the average utilization of servers was so ridiculously low. Um, um, especially for Windows uh, systems where you had a one new server or a blade for every use case you have needed, if you could get it, just so that you don't have to have multiple services because it's Windows. Save it for BeehiveCon social event. Okay, we lost. <laughs> we talked about Beehive built-in color issues. Although he says fixed, but there's still an open ticket for fifteen. We'll see if he gets back. Uh. I will punch that on down. Let's talk about maybe bug track, bug triage later. So, oh, also Patrick. Hey, hello, Patrick. Patrick, Patrick, Patrick Juice. Um, okay, we'll give him a sec to get back to his topics while he is coming back. Any other fun things beyond why VMware? Because that's not one we will cover in the next point. Patrick, hello, you've got hey, the guys. floor. Um, actually, let me put these back where they were. Uh, do you want to give us a quick update on the VNC color issues? It looks like Mark. I, I, I just checked the the issue in the bug tracker, and it seems there's a commit to at least to head. So okay. the problem can now uh, be considered fixed. That won't fix it in the TrueNAS context because IX Systems has no intention to pull any upstream fixes uh, to core. But at least it's fixed in FreeBSD. Yay! Okay, cool. Uh, and do you specify that? Blah, 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 blah. In uh, um, does anyone know if there's a true NAS, true NAS alternative? Uh, I mean, af after um, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, for, for GUI admins, not not for not for yeah. true command true line. NAS scale is developing quite nicely if you're oblivious of, of the underlying operating system. I mean, must give them that credit, it, it works. I, I run it for my Docker-related workloads, and yeah. it's 
it's really going in a in a good direction. Um, so I'll probably keep Truna scale, and either we we will do a, a community supported edition of Truna's core and keep that updated and running, or I will just switch to to plain FreeBSD and Ansible for my jails and all the other ZFS workloads. I mean, my my problem is, um, IX system sees TrueNAS as a NAS system for corporate customers first, which nicely connects to that question about VMware. So it's the backend storage for VMware with ZFS and snapshots and everything, and it's great. And all the hobbyists and home lab enthusiasts see it as a great way to run applications and jails and VMs and yeah, <laughs> oh, well, that's not supported. We never intended you to rely on that. And yada, yada, yada. Then why did you implement it with hundreds, thousands of person hours and a lot of money and push it out to the world to enjoy? And now you're saying it's not important. It's, I mean, J jails and VMs plus ZFS is the reason why I run TrueNAS. Because I have a nice UI for all of that. I I don't need a UI for five Zamba shares that are all set to ACL disabled all guest access because it's my family network here. Patrick, did you give us BSD apps? Yes. Yes, a I did. GPLv3 licensed BSD app repo. <laughs> okay, let's Let's re recheck the license. Maybe he didn't put any license up, or did he? He did. And they chose it for you. Initial commit last month. Yep. Okay, we okay. will take the next forty minutes to read through the GPLv three. So who wants to? <laughs> uh, okay. New general oh, okay. public license um, version three, twenty okay. ninth of June two thousand seven. You are probably aware of the failed attempt at plugins. For TrueNAS based on FreeBSD and Jails and IO Cage, which eventually led to IX systems embracing all things Docker. And again, on the one hand, they say corporate customers don't use all of this. Then why are you making such a fuss about it? It's just, <laughs> if it's not important, why even care? Okay, so we have a broken on, on TrueNAS core, which is still well alive and running well. We have a broken plugin system. We have a perfectly working, performant, well-supported jail ecosystem. And most users are not capable of installing, say, Nextcloud or MinOS or anything on their own. So this by Victor is a collection of scripts that just do that for you. So you want to run MinOS, you click a jail on TrueNAS, or you create a jail with your favorite jail management tool like Jailer on a stock free BSD, you download the script for MinOS, you fire up the script for MinOS, and whoop, you have a working MinOS installation based on free BSD right. packages as much as possible. And of course, live pulling in all that stuff that you need from Node and, well, Java and what Ruby and whatever it is, what the particular application needs that is pulled in at install time. So this is basically curl pipe pseudo sh. Yes, for free. For, 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 for jails. And it's applications people frequently want to run in a jail and are frustrated because they are so difficult to set up manually. Uh, yeah. Antrenic, I mean, where's your snarky jailer really comment? There's no reason why you can just four, bundle that three. into uh, a jail.conf to basically test if it's set up and then bootstrap itself on first start of the jail. You can, of course. So that's the way which is even simpler to consume, basically uh, put this in this, to clone this here, clone this into this slash etc. No, yeah, you jail just, apps you, you, and you then just, just include you just, you it just, from your. You just fetch the single script, and the target audience is mainly TrueNAS users who click their jails in the TrueNAS UI, and then they have a standard empty jail to use, and then they just pull pull up one of the scripts, fire it up, and they end up with a favorite application, which is a good thing. 
but you still have to do that manually or does uh, this follow some convention i o cage understands no no you you just do fetch. you just run the shell script is really you just fetch and run the shell script inside a newly created jail and off you go okay it's nice to get new users up and running until yes. they hunt you for down and want help with uh, migrating to the next release or something. I I used it because I was utterly stumped getting a new version of mine OS installed for my son because this NPM stuff is just hell and Victor just got all the dependencies and all the right versions in there so fired it up and it worked in less than a minute. Nice. Yep. So the value is the knowledge hidden inside the shell scripts, not the code itself. Yes. OK, that makes it clear. I frequently refer to his shell scripts when I'm the other thing that I installed for my, for my friend, paperless NGX. I did a manual install, but I refer to his shell scripts for the steps that are required to get it up and running. It's a, it's a nice reference for commonly requested applications. That's actually a very nice thing. I mean, whenever I start working on jailer file or jailer source or whatever that we're going to name it, I'll, I'll be looking at those and just like porting them into uh, my format yeah, and you, just you, have you them cannot, ready. You, you cannot make a FreeBSD port from all that stuff that yep. just yep. pulls in M M P NPM install. It does, doesn't work. It sucks. One yeah. reason why I love Go, I, and I have never coded in Go, but it makes such a nice porting experience. <laughs> there's even tooling to create the entire GitHub tuple for your make file, and then you have a FreeBSD port and a package, and it's a single statically linked binary, and it's great. No, it's not. It's not. The Go mod, uh, the Go code is internally, but the resulting application is a dynamic elf executable, and if it needs lib uh, sys or something or libc on. 15, okay. then it will pull that in dynamically, and that's what you want because otherwise, things like NSS uh, or um, PEM won't work as expected because those require dynamic linking. So, truly static executable is not what you really want on FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you don't you you do not have after compile time. You do not have to mess with any Go related dependencies. No, that's not. It's all inside the executable, but. The shared libraries are dynamically linked. Uh, system libc, lib m, lib uh, thread, mm. and so on. Normally, at least. Uh, I think you can do it, but there are consequences of doing that. Now, the more I look into these things, I just keep thinking how awesome was Object Pascal with, with Delphi? Take you a know, drink. You just fire up an IDE. You click run and you just have your day, you know. <laughs> no dependency hells, no cabal hell, nothing like that. And no way to easily import code other than just copy and pasting it into your working project directory, hoping that that's the eternally working version and you never have to update. No version control, just a collection of zip archives flying around, right? So. Please take off the rose uh, tinted glasses. <laughs> NPM is a particular negative example, but in general, package management is something very useful to have. If it's not done too badly. So we touched on a few bugs. Mark Lindemann is working on massive bug triage and is looking at looking at uh restarting the bugmeister calls that's why he joined a jail call not too long ago he's looking for strategies and he's uh in touch with satesh on discord i think that's his name um Antrenik, if you're following along with that great if you've got yes, some sir. Insight, insights great let's help them out as we can yes um uh, uh, and they're also looking at I, onboarding new community members in various forms so go ahead yeah I, I i had a question about that and patrick you might be able to answer some of those questions actually 
Tara too, actually. Why not? Uh, so, so, so on the process of onboarding new members, the idea is that we become kind of like mentors to the, our new coming members and help them to get onboarded. So, for example, one of the community members is going to be responsible. You want something in the documentation, wiki, docs, man pages, whatever it is. I'll help you through that process. How to write the talk, the, the docs, what the format is, how to submit. Right. Um, I do most of my work outside of source docs and ports. Most of my work is in system administration. So I was thinking, has there been any kind of, oh my God, Google, so invasive. It's like writing someone else's name, Jesus. Um, yeah. uh, and, and I'm thinking, is there a way to onboard new members to become future FreeBSD system administrators? Oh, interesting. Does that make sense? Because I feel like there's a whole market for that. Um, I have absolutely no idea. We're, we're currently investing meetings and part of a strategy and stuff. Of, yeah, a, a con concept of a strategy for, for a our concept own of company. a concept. Uh, yeah, your for, company, for, for, as you said, we. Okay. For, yeah, for our own company. Okay. Uh, my, my, my colleague uh, Wolfgang will leave in two, two and a half years from now. Uh, we need to hire more staff for the operator administrator department. John, cough, and sound familiar? It. Cough, cough. And it's difficult because it's, it's a very peculiar profile. It's, it's easy to find software developers, but people who are familiar with networking and have fun just tinkering with an OS and with a gazillion different applications yeah cough cough it's, cough, it's, cough. It's, and it's, an understanding of what is maintainable yeah instead of just i found something on reddit in, <laughs> yeah and then it's just yeah okay uh, and if we ever have to update that system and how many ways does it break Cause, cause How I'm, will I'm, you man, even you yourself maintain that over the next five years? Because if 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 there is, because I mean, even Linux is having a problem of sysadmins, right? Like there 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 is a big lack of Linux system administrators who know how the operating system works. You have a lot of DevOps people who can copy paste the YAML. But the, even the sysadmin market is kind of in a bad place. So I'm actually thinking if we can write like a roadmap to teach people how to be sysadmins and do an onboarding of that process of like, hey, who wants to be a free BSD sysadmin professionally? We'll help you to build the home lab. We'll help you to do this with the jails or deploy applications or use D-trace and debugging, etc. So I'm actually wondering if... Um, Patrick, if you had a similar roadmap in your company for your newcomers, maybe we can integrate the knowledge. And if you have had bad luck like us, which is not finding people. <laughs> I, I have one colleague who joined me for, for Europe as uh, by sheer accident and also named Wolfgang, but we have, we have two Wolfgangs now. Wolfgang the Elder and Wolfgang the Younger. And um, the younger one uh, has a strong Linux background. He runs his own YouTube channel, mostly talking about Raspberry Pis and embedded hardware and home automation and systems with low power consumption. And he just joined me for the second EuroBSDCon and he's really getting into it. He at least very much enjoys the the company and the, and the big BSD family and all the people and the the immense knowledge that can be gathered there. He went to the jail from scratch talk by uh, Dave Kottelhuber. And last year, I forced him at gunpoint to attend Kirk's uh, two-day tutorial <laughs> because nobody <laughs> knows how long we will have that available. And uh, yeah, he, he's really enjoying the experience and... Mm, that would be one more person with BSD know-how in the company. But yeah, it's, it's is in that general... Wolfgang, young man from the east? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. well, we we had dinner together with uh, Patrick and the AV crew. So, oh yes, yeah, we we talked. Cool. Yeah, he he even did an interview with BSD now. 
Очень хорошо. During, during the conference. It's, I don't think it's published just yet. They, right, they've been trickling the, the... Two, two, two or three installments over the, the EuroBSC comment. Cool. Okay. Um, nice. Welcome, KFV. Would you like to join in or are you playing Fly on the Wall, which is perfectly acceptable? Hello. Hey. No, Hello. I'm, I'm totally fine. Hello. How oh, are you? Great. Thank you. Where are you coming in? Yeah, from? I've seen you, Micah. <laughs> First time uh, um, I think you're caller, long time listener. Yeah, no, not long time listener. You know, we have spoken, I believe, two years ago, maybe on Pharaohs from Iran, if you remember. So, yep, happy to be here. Anjani told me a few times to join, but unfortunately, I, you know, my situation but it was not really good to, you know, let me join. Um, but I hope that I can be consistent from now on to be in the meetings and contribute further, hopefully. Cool. What are you working on, if anything? Anyway. Uh, currently, in FreeBSC or in yeah. general, okay, in FreeBSC. No, whatever works. Um, I was, okay, I was talking to uh, Warner and I began just, you know, working on a few utilities to capsicumize them. Nice. And um, the other thing that I usually work on is jails and their graph subsystems. And I'm, you know, really interested in anything is uh, to either contribute or develop or anything. And besides... This is a cheap oh, yep. PC collaborator. Uh, sorry, what? That was someone's background in noise. Go ahead. You've got oh, the okay, floor. Okay, Enjoy. okay. No worries. <laughs> yep. And also, uh, lately, I was working on a CACD platform with uh, Dave. Mm, so oh, yeah. that's uh, another that side the project. AI project? Yep. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, the other things that I usually work on are general operating system stuff and networking and compilers so anything related i'm totally fine i mean very cool uh willing to say Thanks. where you're joining us from what uh, sorry what what country are you in oh what country again i'm back to my homeland iran oh but planning to move again yeah last time we spoke i was in sweden uh, but now i'm again in iran got it uh, welcome, welcome. Um, Thank you. Ah, well, um, what a diverse, wonderful group. So what is your chatty, chatty platform of choice? A lot is going on Discord and people simultaneously love and hate that insofar as it's proprietary and history can be hard to follow and it's definitely not a wiki or a handbook. Where can one mm -hmm. find you if we were to just say, hey, question for you? What's your platform? Uh, yeah, I message is my best. So I always respond quickly. IRC? Um, IRC too, right? Oh, there you go. Uh, but uh, I message, if anyone's got, you know, yep. Uh, and I'm also on Discord but, and Telegram. Yeah, oh. Telegram, IRC, I message. I am more active on. The Discord, I usually just check once a day, day at night. Yeah. Understood. Cool. Anyway, welcome. Are you and... familiar? Go ahead, Jan. With the uh, different capsule methods, is there something like a shared list of uh, who is working on adding capsicum uh, support to which tools so that there's no repeated effort of? everyone doing the same compression utility or something? Um, I found something on the wiki uh, oh. about tools yeah. that are added, you know, but it's, I believe it's not updated. So I had to take a look at most utilities and see um, which of them just, you know, included the Capsicom header. Uh, maybe I could just contribute to a wiki page to just, you know, update the list. But there's a list, yep. Yeah. Is, is there any is there any capsicum does anyone know if there's any capsicum tutorial because one of the nice things yeah. about open BSD is tutorial a capsicum tutorial because one of the nice things about open pledge is like hey here's a 10 page you read it 
Now you know how to pledge programs, but Capsicum didn't have that kind of a feeling. It 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 felt a lot more complex. I mean, the way it was just found. totally different. I would I say that it doesn't exist blog pages. because it, sorry. Please right, go no, ahead. no, no, go ahead. You go. Uh, so um, I think this doesn't exist because it's impossible to create the, this kind of documentation. You could write a good documentation on how to, basically, if you're writing for new code from scratch, what you have to change, uh -huh. and basically how to use uh, the Casper helpers and so on. The Casper will help us with libcasper. It's no longer a centralized Casper D. So, uh, but the problem is that just fundamentally, Capsicum is a clean, pure capability API with mathematical guarantees, uh, except uh, if there are bugs. But uh, basically, Capsicum promises you that capabilities are strictly monotonic and there is no uh, global namespaces you could abuse and so on, which is the fundamental, uh, the theoretically sound way to go. Instead, pledge is a useful hack. It's in a lot of ways an elegant hack, but it is not a capability mechanism. It's a way to just subset the system call interface into yes. useful groups, whereas Capsicum is its own ABI, basically, even if all of it is also part of the free BSD AP, default ABI. So this new, uh, the extended free BSD API, which then gets only subsetted into full free BSD and capability mode, free BSD, means that once you're in capability mode, you're not getting out unless there's a security vulnerability in the kernel um, or some outside helper exists, which is either part of your policy that this helper is supposed to be there or it's a vulnerability. Um, mm -hmm. So Capsicum, that's why it's so hard to port there's the retrofit uh, Capsicum into applications which have non-trivial interaction with the system. So it, it doesn't matter how complex the application logic internally is. It's basically the same to add it to a highly advanced SAT solver uh, with doing crazy uh, theoretical um computer science uh, and the other side, just a GSET decompression tool. It's basically the same working uh, problem for the operating system. It's just, which system calls do you use to do it and in what way? So uh, something like Beehive is the end of what's reasonable to easily retrofit because Beehive busy at startup opens a bunch of devices and a, maybe a config file and that's it. And afterward it just uses them. But if you have something like Nginx, which can be reloaded or HA proxy where you can reconfigure basically everything via a runtime uh, API, yeah, it's really uh, not easy to add some kind of sandboxing which is meaningful. And yeah, this article seems the most straightforward. I'm surprised there that have been simply mentions it. I think around 2018 to add uh, to basically do something like um, oblivious sandboxing, so that the sandbox has hard pass and basically LD preload style hacks to try to be transparent, so that you don't have to rewrite. The application. The annoying part is that the more dependencies an application has, the final frontier would be something like uh, a modern web browser with its untold number of um, external dependencies it pulls in for libjpg, libpng, turbojpg, and so on. Uh, thousand and one tools um, and libraries. 
and all of those interact in complicated ways. Um, and you just, even the trivial parts, you have to make sure that it's really as simple as you think it is. Because otherwise, a lot of just innocent uh, things which are really not dangerous will break if you try to do it with Capsicum. That's what I have found out tinkering with it, at least. So um, thank you for digging up that old C uh, demon post. Old um, a year ago, fortunately. It's not too crazy old. Mm -hmm. And on okay, the, the, the wiki, the documentation is pretty redundant. It's, it seems to be the same list that they show. <laughs> So yeah, uh, you look at that list, you look at FreeBSD, and mm -hmm. it lists the same applications. Yeah, we know, copy-paste. But anyway, cool. Yeah, so the, the simplest thing is to look at something like Yes, which is about as trivial as a useful application can be. Next is something like Jot, uh, which just really reads CLI arguments and produces output, which, okay, the attack vector is very yep. small, that those are the thing, kind of things you can get perfectly safe, sane, correct, even in C, but um, yeah, more useful things would be uh, unpacking tar archives uh, in such with our, I mean, or our archives where you want to make sure that it really doesn't leave its uh, target directory and can't be attacked by putting interesting things in the uh, before the decompressor or something. Cool. Does anyone want to take uh, responsibility for this lovely paragraph and describe it? For long-running complex processes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, wrote, I wrote that uh, because I myself have just been uh, approached by the ports team for a port that where I am the maintainer is Acme DNS and they are adding jailing capability to each and every single port um, by default, which is a good oh, thing. Oh, wow. Okay. Do, does that get gnarly with upstream or that is upstream on various ports, various, very uh, generally welcoming of such? Additions? No, no, that, that is upstream in the sense that it's oh, great. previous maintainers. Ah, uh, okay. The, the, the ACME DNS project does not care if the process is jailed or not. Uh, uh, Patrick, we're it, talking it, about the new jail uh, feature in rc.com, yeah. right? Yes, 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 right. They Perfect. are, or someone else is. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just dig out the reference from okay. my uh, conversation with Alexander Leidinger. Okay. Just a second. Great. That would be. That's a very nice feature. So it means you can run the acme.sh script as a root on no, no, the, 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 the the acme DNS server. I'm, I'm oh, I don't know what that I'm, is. I'm, I'm, I'm maintaining the Acme DNS server. It's a lightweight, authoritative DNS server with an API. So you oh. can add records to it from the Acme DNS or dehydrated or any other Acme client for use in the DNS uh, protocol instead of the HTTP one. Oh. oh. So you would put the right uh, TXT and CNAME records and so on in yeah. place to basically forward your uh, ACME of, uh, challenges from your primary zone into a different zone. And then that's your filter server for that. So you don't have to do the DNS challenge and response on your authoritative DNS server for your zone. Instead, you can delegate that to a different zone by placing the Ooh. right records in the zone. Um, I haven't deployed it, but it makes it interesting because then you don't have to make all those host names accessible through some kind of HTTP proxy, which then gets to respond to the uh, original HTTP um, challenges. That's very interesting. This could be very useful. This is actually very good. Nice. Do you see well, the links? Yes, that seems to be oh. it. Yes. Cool. Yeah. But I mean, I guess the problem also applies to my uh, acme.sh problem because 
I, I, I use Acme.sh, which is a shell script for the Acme protocol. Many do. To, yep. Yeah. And the problem with it is, well, I don't want to play around with, you know, permissions all day long. So I just run it as root. But that's also problematic because, like, you're sending HTTP requests using a shell script to the internet. God knows what could possibly go wrong. So um, it, it's nice that now... You don't have to now, run Acme.sh as root. No, I know you don't have to. You you can run around as a separate user, but then I have to think about the security permissions of the keys and which group can read them based on which process and all of that. Yeah. Or you yeah. just uh, use uh, sudo uh, or do as to uh, copy them into the application mm -hmm. directory with the yes. right permissions. Yeah, that, that's also very uh, reasonable. Yeah, yeah. It's so, um, easier um, to automate. Oh yeah. Oh, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Okay, gang, anything else? We've covered a lot of ground. Around the world. Now we're just some people from Australia. Oh, I talked to Rob this week. He's doing great. Probably sleeping right now. <laughs> that was the yeah, uh Tubsta challenge. He's like a 4 a.m. call is not super attractive. Well, Jokes gang. On him. Okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Should I do the honors? Yes, sir. For our YouTube watchers, please like and subscribe. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Antrenig. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.